I'm Jason Belzer for Athletic Director U, and today I'm joined by Daniel Parker from Parker Executive Search, Donna Woodruff, who is the Director of Athletics at Loyola University, Maryland, mm -hmm. and Tavares Hardy, the head men's basketball coach at Loyola, Maryland. Um, we're here to discuss the anatomy of a coaching search. We're going to try to bring people through the coach search process um, from the very beginning to the hiring, the final hiring of the candidate. Uh, Donna, this past March, your former men's basketball coach resigned, um, and you were now thrust into a coaching search. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened within that first 24 hours, um, who you called uh, when that resignation was tendered, uh, some of the stakeholders that you involved, and what was going through your mind through that time? Yeah, it's uh, when something like that happens and you're sitting in the athletic director chair a lot goes through your mind uh, right away and then it becomes okay now we've got to move forward uh, so I did have to reach out obviously to the president uh, to the vice president that works uh, with athletics most directly and say okay this is where we are uh, this is what I think I want to do uh, moving forward and then try and identify what the the plan is going to be so so we sat down right away and uh, talk through you know, how I thought we should move, move, move forward at that point and what I had to decide, okay, what was I going to look for? Uh, this was my first men's basketball hire, uh, so I had to do some you know, reflection on what I thought was important as we move forward. Um, obviously, you already know a lot about your own program, so you have an idea of what is important to you, but you need to really solidify that, and that's what I spent uh, some time doing. Close the door uh, right after I met with the, the president and the vice president, and you know, then had to, to solidify in my mind exactly what we wanted to do moving forward. Can you talk a little bit about maybe what you thought about in terms of what you might be looking for? And uh, was it you and the president? Or were there any other stakeholders that were involved in kind of coming up with the criteria of who you're going to look for next? Yeah, at, at first it was um, just me and me sharing what was important to me from uh, you know, my perspective athletically. Obviously, there are things that are important to the university, to the institution, because a men's basketball coach is going to represent the institution in many different ways. So there are things that are important to them, but there are things that are very specifically important uh, for on the court and uh, you know in the athletics de department. So they certainly, we were on the same page right off the bat. We want some, wanted somebody who would be able to go out into the, the community and represent us well as an institution, but then there were certain things that I knew that I was going to, to have to look for. And I did spend that time trying to come up. There's probably you know five, six, seven things that were very, very um, important to me uh, specifically. And, and through the entire process, uh, they came out over and over again and you know, eventually ended up uh, here. Sure. And how did you come to the decision or uh, decide with your president about whether or not to run the search internally or hire a search firm to help you in the process? Yeah, so admittedly, uh, right off the bat, I stated uh, to the president that I thought that I could do this uh, alone. You know, um, I had at my previous institution had been involved in you know the hiring of a couple of men's basketball coaches. Maybe I wasn't the the one who made the final decision, and I just felt like okay, I could I could do this alone. Um, and I explained why, talked to the president, uh, vice president about it, and I will tell you the pretty much the you know next day. It might have been about 36 hours later. Um, you know, the president called and said, "I know you. You uh, feel really strongly about doing this on your own. Here's what I'd like you to think about. Uh, we'll support if you'd like to consider talking with a, a search firm." Um, and then he laid out from his perspective what some of the pros and cons you know, might be and you know, said, you can do what, whichever way you want it to go, but think about this and how it might help you. Um, and I'll be honest with you, 36 hours in, uh, the number of people that reach out to you, there was not a chance that I could have uh, done it as well if I chose to just do it by myself. That's what I learned uh, you know, through the process. So I appreciated that you know, uh, my um, you know, institution was supportive if that's the way that I wanted to go. And so I was going to ask you about maybe one or two of the reasons why you finally did decide to you know, hire a search firm. Was it the ability to kind of handle that process? And was it one of, that, one of the big concerns that your president had? Yeah, um, it, it was. And 
because so many people reach out to you and all the people that you know in the athletics world know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody that they want you to talk to. And um, you, know, you, you can start to blur the lines as to what really is important to you if you have all these different people that you feel you know, have some responsibility to get back to, to talk to. Um, and at the end of the day, if that's taking you away from the most important thing, which is to get the best coach you know, for you, for me, it became clear that I wanted to stay focused on this. And if there was someone, um, you know, a, a firm that could help me to do that, uh, to weed through some of those things, I still was going to have to talk to a lot of people. But if there was someone that could help me, you know, with that, it, it ended up being the best decision for me. Sure. And so the decision is then made to hire Parker Executive Search. And so you call Daniel, you are retained. Right. What happens then, Daniel? What is the next step in the process once your firm is on the clock, so to speak. Well, Donna and I uh, have known Donna for a few years, and uh, I know a little bit about the institution, working with the president before and some of the key uh, constituents there, but really uh, ask a lot of probing questions. So Donna and I, I think a lot of people don't understand, is, is before the search gets started, we spend time going through their budget, going through, you know, what can you pay a coach? Can you give them a multi-year contract? Let's talk about a memorandum of understanding. What are you looking for? What, what did you like? What did you not like? What's going on in the program? Why do you think it didn't work out? I think, uh, you know, I asked Donna to do, you know, share with me because she had done a really deep dive on her program and I wanted to hear it from her. So we spent hours on the phone. I mean, this was over the course of several days before we reached out to any coaches. And then we have a database. We have thousands of coaches in the database. And first thing I always ask all the ADs is, do you have a short list? Do you have people in mind? Because she, she had been through a search before. She, she knows the marketplace. Uh, and she had some people in mind. I said, OK, let, let me take that list. And then let me look through my database. And based on your compensation, based on the style of play, based on you know, recruiting geography and everything that you're looking for. Academics plays a big piece. I know we talked a lot about she wants somebody that understands they're in the Patriot League. Patriot League is, uh, they got the academic index. And uh, there was a lot of things that go into it besides just basketball. Fit for the institution, of course. And, and I know the president well. So I think we had an understanding of the institution and, and of Donna and her vision for the athletic program. But we really talked a lot about specifics before uh, we started talking about candidates. And then we spent a lot of time looking at specific coaches. I mean, Tavares was one of probably 50 or 60 or 70 coaches that we looked at uh, in our database. And then I gave Ta Donna some time to go through, and she spent a lot of time looking through the database. And then we would talk uh, every couple hours. I'd say, hey, can I call you back at 4 o'clock later today? And uh, let's talk about coaches and the ones that maybe are fit or, or maybe are not a fit. So we had a big list. I always encourage uh, our ADs see more than less. Uh, that's a term I like to use because I think you go into a search thinking you might be looking for something. And as you look at coaches and look at profiles, she was looking at videos and press conferences and looking at a lot of records and so she was very thorough and then I encouraged her to talk to a lot of coaches so uh, there was a lot that went into it before we even got to the stage of who we're going to reach out to. So Donna you are given this database you have 60 70 names in this database and profiles how are you kind of assessing each candidate are you reading their biographies are you you're looking at their records I mean a lot of them probably assistant coaches so maybe don't have the head coaching experience where you can say this guy's a winner versus this guy um, you know, has a little bit of a different background. How are you making that assessment and comparing it to those criteria that you've kind of set out for yourself? Yeah, I mean, obviously you can only take so much from what, what's there on, on paper, but um, if you know what you think you're looking for, you can then, uh, you know, maybe pull out things that seem like they, they might match. So uh, obviously being at a, an institution where academics is of high importance, um, someone who maybe had been uh, in an academic, a high academic setting that might stand out. Um, obviously, wins and losses are important, but like you said, if you are an assistant coach, you know, what, how much did you play into that? Um, but also, maybe for me, I didn't want someone who had been at 15 different institutions. You know, I, I, I liked, okay, how have you built a program? That was something that was going to be important. So I was looking for, for those kind of things, uh, you know, as, as, you know, Daniel knows, I did spend a lot of time reading that. 
uh, reading that information. They provide a ton of background information for you. So, you know, you can do that late at night. You can close your door. You can look at that. You can look at it on your phone uh, from anywhere and, and really just kind of dig into that. That doesn't mean you get all the answers that you need. There's still going to have to be the time. Who am I going to speak to, et cetera? So um, Daniel being very available, I was able to say, okay, I looked at this, um, you know, moved some people around. This person sounds interesting, you know, to me. Uh, do you know any more? I see maybe a gap in something, or why isn't this in there? Uh, what do you know about about this? And, and Daniel was able to fill in some of those, you know, those blanks. And then you get to the point where you, you know, maybe between the two of you, you know, you discuss who you might be interested in having, you know, that next conversation uh, with. Sure. So what I'd add too to. What, what I loved working with Donna was she didn't look at just high major assistant coaches like, like Tavares. I mean, we looked at head coaches at Division Three or Division Two. I mean, we were looking broadly. I mean, there was no real handcuffs that we're just going to look at one subset. So Donna really set out to be very thorough, talk to a lot of coaches, and make sure she had the best result possible. So we spent a lot of time, we, we had head coaches in, in the interview process. We had high major assistants, we had mid-major assistants, we had coaches East Coast, West Coast, we had them a little bit all over. So she was very thorough on, on the coaches that she looked at before we got down to the decision for who we were gonna bring in for an interview. Sure, so how many candidates did you initially choose to interview in the first round? And how did that process go once you, you have that list, you know, the X number of people that you need to start well, from? Well, I, I would say, and, and Donna and I, we were just, I mentioned going down memory lane here, uh, but uh, she probably talked to north of 30 coaches on the phone, and some of those for as much as an hour. Uh, so when I talk about thorough, very thorough, uh, and I probably talked to 50 plus coaches on the phone or, or agents or representatives or others. So we narrowed it down, and Donna, she picked, I think, about eight coaches that she wanted to bring into Baltimore after having those conversations. So she mentioned we give them the background work, we give them information, but at the end, Donna makes the decision. I think she did have a small committee that she consulted with, but it was her decision on who she ultimately wanted to talk to on the phone and then who she wanted to bring into Baltimore for those interviews. Sure. So you went from 30 conversations, dwindle it down to eight. Here's the list. This is who we want. How do you decide? how the actual interview process is going to go. Take us through that. Stakeholders, who's going to be in that room interviewing the person? Um, how is this all going to be coordinated? You have people coming into the city, coming out of the city. Discuss some of the logistics behind that. So I'll say from, from my perspective, certainly when you're on the outside, you might think that the search firm dictates everything, right? This is how many people you're going to bring in. I did not find that to, to be the case. Uh, we worked together to figure out what was going to be the best, you know, for us, and then they help handle uh, the logistics once you, you decide how many you're going to, to bring. But for me, the stakeholders that I had to make sure, um, you know, were on board, we chose after some uh, consultation about what we were thinking of doing, that when we brought these people in to, um, to meet with us in, in Baltimore, that we wanted it to be just more than me and maybe you know, one other person. Um, and we chose, because this was important to us, the way we were going to, to go, we had two um, trustees that were going to be involved uh, at that point, and uh, also one of the vice presidents. So there were four of us, you know, a as well as uh, Daniel and a, and a colleague. And that was, that was good for us. Um, it, it worked well because their opinions, their feedback, uh, their involvement in men's basketball as well as the athletics department um, was going to be important moving forward and we valued their opinion so it allowed for us to get different perspectives um, you know as we went through that process even though sometimes people don't do it that way but that's the way that we thought it was going to work and, and we had talked through through that and that's what we came up with sure. it was a great group it was it was four people that were interviewing and uh, they were I think at one point we split up two and two so we did separate interviews uh, but uh, we did it over the course of a day and a half a couple of days we brought in everybody into Baltimore I thought I think it's important if you can bring them into a close uh, hotel uh, I think most of the 
coaches that came in actually went and rented a car and toured the campus and got to see some of the facilities just quietly to just drive around neighborhoods and areas and get a real feel for the place. So we talked early on with Donna and her committee, what are some dates that are available for you? And let's make this easy on you. Let's bring the coaches to you. Let's do it quickly and quietly. Nobody knew when we were doing the interviews. And that was the first round. And letting them have that conversation. Now, she had already talked to those coaches, most of them for at least an hour before they were invited in. So it was a very thorough, deep process by the time they came to Baltimore. Sure. Tavares, so when did you decide that Loyola was a job that you were interested in, uh, and, and how did you let the school know? What was the process that you kind of took to try to get yourself involved as a candidate? Yeah, well, first off, just the opportunity to be a Division I head coach or a head coach at any level uh, is phenomenal, and I'm so appreciative, appreciative to have that um, as an opportunity. For me, Loyola was an unbelievable institutional fit, and I knew it as soon as I saw it that the job opened. Um, I'm a basketball junkie. I watch a lot of hoops. And uh, so I've been a big fan of the Patriot League, not just because they have great coaches, but uh, because the academic and the true student athlete experience that each school emphasizes. And then with Loyola, when you add the fact that you got the city of Baltimore, uh, you have an incredible opportunity to build a program. I mean, it just was an unbelievable fit that I really wanted to target once I saw that, that the opportunity was available. Um, how did I go about it? Well, it started you know, early in my coaching career. I figured out what not to do. <laughs> um, I had set a, uh, I had a pretty good name for myself early on, or what I thought, and a job opened, and I kind of went crazy. Uh, it was a job that I thought I'd be perfect for, and I did everything wrong. Um, starting with, I called a bunch of powerful people and tried to get them to bully, their, bully uh, my way into the door. Um, I, I had an interview that I just flat out bombed because I tried to do too much. And then I did what I think um, I really wanted not to do here, which was I leaked my name to a newspaper. Um, so I already had that experience of, okay, that's the exact wrong way to go about pursuing a job. Um, so I kept it simple. Um, as we all know in any profession, the, the first step to getting a job or progressing um, is to do great at your current job. And so I wanted to make sure I've done that uh, throughout my coaching career. And then, um, you know, when Loyola, uh, Loyola particularly opened uh, in particular, I made sure that I reached out to my agent, uh, let him know I was interested. I reached out to my head coach and uh, let Coach Pastor know that this is something I would really want. And, uh, you know, really that was it. Um, I hope that, you know, through those connections that I would have an opportunity to one day talk to someone that had hiring power. Sure. And so eventually you're told that Donna wants to have a conversation with you. What's your mindset going into that conversation? Did you prepare? Um, just talk about that first initial contact with Donna. Yeah, so I, I received a call um, from Daniel. I was in a coaches meeting. I walked out <laughs> and uh, he asked if I would be willing to talk to Donna around 6 p.m., of course. And, uh, but we had our first spring workout that day. And so I didn't really have time in between the meeting and that, the end of workout to prepare. Um, so I didn't want to tell anyone, but I had to ask one of my GAs to help me out <laughs> and just get me a lot of information um, now that there's an opportunity. So um, in between the workout, I went back to my office and uh, really had a chance to, okay, I know what Loyola is on the surface, but what is Loyola for real? And you know, who is Donna Woodruff? And so I had a chance to, to quickly learn. And then at the end of the day, I knew that I just had to be myself. I knew that my experiences um, you know, both as a student athlete and all my coaching experiences directly translated to what it would take to be successful at Loyola. And so I just wanted to be able to tell that story efficiently and effectively, which uh, I think I did. Did she grill you in that first conversation or was it casual? No, it was very conversational. Um, you know, she hit me with, with, with certain things. And, um, but at the end of the day, you know, she was, it was more of a get to know you. And um, again, I think that you know, I was very confident just in terms of my knowledge of the league and my, you know, my background. Um, so I just felt like be myself and would be okay. What specifically made you feel like you were a good fit for the job? If there's two or three things that you can. Yeah. So when you look at Loyola, um, you know, it, it has an impeccable academic reputation. Um, the Patriot League is top level basketball, uh, chance to compete for championships with, with, with uh, again, like I said, great coaches. And you have a wonderful city like Baltimore where you have tremendous resources to be able to tap into. 
And I experienced a lot of that as a student athlete at Northwestern in terms of uh, the academic piece, playing in the Big Ten, and then Chicago being right there, and then working at Northwestern as a coach, working at a place like Georgetown, working at a place like Georgia Tech. There are a lot of uh, commonalities. And so uh, I felt like there are not a lot of coaches who have sort of gone down that path, and that can be a differentiating factor for me. I view the academic piece as a competitive advantage. A lot of people don't. They think it's a challenge. Um, I think it's what's going to make us great. And so being able to tell that story, I thought, for a school, when you look at their mission statement, um, you look at their vision, um, their strategic plan, I just thought I was directly aligned with what they may be looking for. Sure. So Donna, you had this conversation with Tavares, coming up with a list of eight. He's on the list. Um, talk to me about that first initial eight interviews that you did. What were some of the things that you saw in the candidates? Was there anything that you were surprised by? Was there anything that stood out about Tavares um, differently from the other candidates? Or was, were the candidates very close to each other? Mm -hmm. um, as, as Daniel had said, we, we were very open to um, a lot of different backgrounds and, and maybe where they were in their, their career. So we still, we did have a, a variety of people that were sitting in, in front of us. Um, I think we were very, very fortunate uh, that we had a very strong, you know, pool that ended up there uh, those, those two days. Um, all of them were, they wouldn't have been there if this didn't, didn't stand out to me through the, the process. I was very clear that I wanted only to talk with people regardless of what, how many wins and losses that want it to be at Loyola. Uh, not just want it to be, you know, a, a coach. I get that, um, but it was really very important because that's the only way I thought that one, you'd be able to work with me, and you know, and then then last for a little while and, and build our program. So I think we were very fortunate that those that um, came to campus, I knew that through the process of talking, you know, to them that these people would, uh, you know, all of them would would fit that. Um, through that process, though, I think. Um, we obviously had to get down to a, a smaller number. Um, we found that we had a lot of really good you know, people, but then it became, okay, how, not just these seven questions or what you can learn in an hour and a half, um, but what do we think really stands out about everything? How are they gonna work with the student athletes? How are they gonna be in the community? Do they get the bigger picture in our particular case of a Jesuit community on, on campus? You know, at what is the appreciation level for Baltimore? You, you can prepare for an interview and everything you can read about an institution, but it, was it coming out that they really got it um, and really that you could see yourself for me? I needed a partner, you know, that was going to help build this this program. And um, you know, certainly through the process, some people did that better than others. And obviously, Tavares did stand out in in not just how prepared he was, but how authentic he was in his his preparation. Sure, Daniel, what's your role in this process now that the interviews are actually going on? Yeah, it, it depends on the AD. I think you know, my real part is to to get out of the way. You know, to, to let Donna and her team, I sat in on the interviews, I like to sit in there, but I'm not asking questions. I'm sitting in the back of the room and really letting Donna and her team ask the questions. They, they do ask me, you know, probing questions. Have you had a coach in a search before? Or are they in other searches? They're always asking, I remember Donna asked me uh, on all of the coaches, do they really want our job? Have you had that conversation? Have you asked them? What do their agents say about them? So I'm there as a resource to answer questions, make sure the coaches aren't running into each other in the lobby. You know, we take a lot of pride in, in being very confidential and, and treating Tavares and all of the coaches uh, that were in the process. Uh, very well but uh, as Donna mentioned she had a great pool of candidates I think when we got down to the end and we started talking about the coaches and we were gonna bring three to campus it was hard to eliminate any of the, the coaches and uh, I think at one point she said well I like these six or these seven I said well Donna we only interviewed six or seven we got we can only bring three to campus so uh, it, it was challenging it, you know so once again, we had a lot of discussions. We were there for, for many hours after the interviews were over, going through and talking about what did you hear? What did you hear? You know, what do you think about this? And, uh, you know, before we narrowed it down, and then we really we put them in order and we said, 
all right, let's have one, two, three, four, five, six. I mean, at the end of this process, we got to hire a coach. And there's a lot of things, I think, uh, for those of you that haven't been through a process before, there's a lot of things behind the scenes. Now we got to negotiate. Now we got to work with the agents. We're going to have them sign MOUs before they come to campus. Their families still need to come to campus. They may be in other searches. So there's a lot of things behind the scenes that are going on. Everybody's doing a search at the same time. So we have competition. We're not the only school that's looking for a basketball coach right now. So I really help Don and the institution and kind of navigate those waters behind the scenes. And Tavares and I had many conversations. I, and I said, Tavares, don't come to campus unless you really want this job. I talked to his head coach. I did referencing, on-list, off-list reference. I talked to a lot of people at Georgia Tech about Tavares. I talked to people at Northwestern about him. So I really knew a lot of information that I could share with Donna and her team before we had them to come to campus. Because I wanted to make sure the three coaches that came to campus we, that were negotiated with, they knew what the terms were, and that they really wanted this job. So when they came to campus, met the president, she just had to pick which one was the right fit. Donna, was there any dissension, or was it mostly consensus in terms of who was going to be that final three amongst your search committee and the people that were involved in that first round of, of interviews? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that there was a dissension. I think what was good is that we had really good candidates. So um, as we had discussed, we had separated a little bit, myself and, and one trustee, and the vice president, another trustee. So, and, and we kind of took different tact as we were meeting with uh, each of the candidates. And when we came together, it allowed us to have a little bit of a different perspective as to how conversation went. And it, it allowed, aside from us all hearing the exact same thing, we had different perspectives. And that allowed for us to go back and forth. And uh, we did get to the point where we literally voted and said, OK, you know, let's put yours in order. Um, you know, so the, the four of us put ours in, in order. And then that led to you know, what, what I would say was very close. <laughs> you know, um, but we did end up with the, the three that we brought to campus. And we all felt good about it. Um, I, I think, as Daniel mentioned, I'd, we could have brought you know, more. And, uh, but at some point, you did have to, to whittle down. And, and we knew we were going to take them then through what the next part of the process would be, which did involve more people. Um, so that would help us delineate even more between those three that were there. But um, yeah, there wasn't, a, there wasn't a whole lot of deten de dissension. Uh, we were very pleased with the way the search was going. I'm assuming that Tavares was number one on the list. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Tavares, what was your strategy going into these interviews? And, and you went in thinking one thing, prepared in one way. And what did you think when you, when you left? Yeah, so the first interview I was, uh, interesting situation there was a snowstorm <laughs> and so I had to fly into a different city and drive up um, but was able to get there get a good night's sleep and I felt you know different from the first time I spoke with Donna I had a I had plenty of time to prepare and so I knew who I was going to be talking to I had an unbelievable amount of information about the school and was really excited about the opportunity so I felt really confident going in um, you know the the two trustees interestingly enough had a finance background, <laughs> and uh, I worked in that world. Uh, so I knew I really wanted to attack that aspect of uh, my story with those guys uh, to kind of be, you know, I didn't know who the other candidates were, but I, I felt like that would differentiate me. Um, I knew that the vice president would be very intrigued by someone that was fully committed to having a presence in Baltimore and making sure that the school was represented. And um, I love that opportunity. Um, I'm really passionate about that. And so I wanted to make sure I portrayed that. And then I knew Donna wanted to win, <laughs> looking at her background. And um, you know, I, I was very careful with who I spoke with because, like I said, I didn't want my name associated with the job because I felt that um, you know, that tends not to go well sometimes. So, um, but I did speak with a couple of coaches that she's worked with before to get more information uh, just about her philosophy and, and how she, she sees the game and, and whatnot. So I was able to portray. Uh, my story um, to, to what she was used to. Uh, and so all that was great. I will say, leaving the first interview, I felt good, I felt really good, except during that whole transition period where one coach was leaving and you know I had to wait back. Uh, I won't say exactly what was said, but someone said something that made me think, okay, your interview was great, but you don't really fit what they're looking for. And so I went back to my hotel and I was upset. <laughs> you know, I felt like I just wasted my time. I called my wife. It's like, uh, this didn't work out. I called my agent, was like, why did I just waste my time? And then literally 10 minutes later, I got a phone call from Daniel saying I was 
coming back. <laughs> um, and, and so maybe not 10 minutes, I don't remember exactly how long, but shortly thereafter, I had misread the entire situation. So emotions are high. Um, you know, I felt like I did everything I needed to do in terms of preparation and, you know, I felt good about how everything went down, but you just never know. You're always looking for, you know, an edge. And, um, you know, I was happy to get that call because I, I didn't feel good after I left uh, in my Uber. Sure. And, and so uh, it seems that the second round of interviews happened shortly thereafter. The first, I mean, how short are we talking about? And why was this timeline seemingly so compressed or so quick? Well, we were uh, going up against the Final Four. And Donna and I, from the very beginning, we talked timing. And uh, not only did we talk coaches, but we said, you know, when do we want to get this done by? First of all, what's the president's schedule look like? When is, can the president be available? So we, we backed into the date. So. We had a date or two dates on the calendar that the president was available. So we had that first round of interviews the week before or a few days before, knowing that the president was going to be on campus and those key stakeholders were available to meet with that round of coaches, those three coaches. And then we also wanted to give this next coach a chance to go to the Final Four. So to have the press conference or the announcement before the Final Four, I thought it was very important to Donna and, and I agreed with her that this head coach has a chance to go to the Final Four, to meet other coaches, start putting their staff together and start hitting the recruiting trail. I mean, I, I think a lot of times people don't understand. You don't have a lot of time after that press conference or that announcement. You got to hit the road. You got to start re-recruiting your own players. You got to re you got to recruit new players, and you got to start putting that staff together. So it was critically important that Tavares answered in his in his interview. What's he going to do? What is your 30-day plan, 60-day, 90-day plan? Knowing the Final Four is probably in two weeks from now. And so how quickly after the first set of interviews did the second interviews happen? Was it, it was a day, two week. days, a week? Yeah. No, it, yeah, probably the next week. So yeah. the next interviews week. were probably Wednesday, Thursday, and the, and the next round was Monday, Tuesday. Did your uh, tactics into the second interview change? Were you asking a completely different line of questioning? Were there other people now involved? Obviously, the president now was getting involved. With it. Were any other stakeholders brought into the process for the second round? Yeah, we did do that a little differently. Obviously, at this point, you know, I knew how I felt about the, the candidates, but it not just that it was important that other people were involved because, oh, you have to involve other people, but because their perspective and their feedback to me would be helpful, too, because everybody comes um, when you're welcoming someone new into the community, they come at it from a, a different perspective. So we decided, and this was with working with the uh, the president and, and vice president, uh, that we would have a probably. I think we ended up with about seven, you know, people uh, that the candidates were going to have to meet with, and then they would, yeah, which is is kind of a lot sometimes in uh, men's basketball searches. That's not what you would do. You would keep it small. Um, I felt good about that. I felt good about the people that we had coming to, to campus. Uh, there's a part that says, okay, if, if you don't love that, then maybe you're not the right fit for us because we are a, a tight community. And um, they were all, you know, on board with it. And uh, so we ended up with, you know, a couple of vice presidents, whether it was advancement, uh, student development, uh, people that we trusted on campus that I would trust their, their feedback. Um, one of the Jesuits who works very closely uh, with the athletics department that I would value his uh, opinion. Uh, and the candidates were going to have to meet again separately, uh, you know, with the president and vice president. And they would meet separately, you know, with, with me. Um, and then that group, you know, would have an opportunity to meet with them um, as a whole group and, you know, let them grill them uh, for a little while. And, and then I would gather again at the end of the, the interview process with uh, the candidate. Um, so Tavares, you're going back for a second interview. Is anything changing on your end in terms of what you need to do? I mean, you feel like you, you initially thought that maybe you didn't impress them as much as you should have. Did you say, hey, I have to reapproach this from a different yeah. And, point of view? And, and I felt like, again, I felt great leaving the interview in terms of being able to get my story across, being able to talk about, you know, how I was the right fit. Um, but after leaving, what I was a little alarmed about was, okay, have I done enough to show Donna that I can coach basketball? <laughs> because there's so much to talk about in terms of my experiences and the academics and I, can you really coach? <laughs> so I had to, going into the second interview, I want to make sure I showed her that. Um, because if you ask some of my former bosses, they would say, that's probably what I'm best at. <laughs> and then I wanted to make sure um, with everyone else, you know, sort of what was bothering me or not, you know, 
it, it was more, okay, you're competing against people who may have, you know, recently won at a very high level. Um, and, you know, we had a rough season last year. So how do you attack that? So I, I looked at it as, okay, you know, because I don't want to talk about any colleges, but let's say Mike Brown, the assistant coach from the Golden State Warriors, <laughs> how would you attack if you were battling him for this job? And so what would make me special versus him? Because we're not going to have Clay Thompson and Steph Curry <laughs> and, and, and whatnot. And so how would we, how would I be the best fit? And so I really broke down um, a way of analyzing why I was the best fit. And it wasn't about, as Donna said, it wasn't about what previous head coaches were able to do. Like, why would I be able to be a good head coach? And so I really locked in on those two things, those two factors. Why am I the right fit? and why we're going to have success with me at the helm, and then how can I show Donna exactly how I can coach basketball, and then don't lose the other stuff, which I felt like I was already doing pretty well with. Sure. Donna, what, did, what impressed you most about Tavares in that final interview that set him out against everybody else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so part of um, what I did during that day was, you know, I ended up picking up uh, or meeting uh, the candidate usually at their, their hotel and, you know, kind of had that hour or so before I was taking uh, Tavares, uh, let's say, to campus to meet with the, the group. And that, uh, actually, the, the, uh, there's a little bit of construction going on there. So we sat uh, around the, uh, the corner. But actually, I think that was probably one of the better conversations we had. I remember he had already done a scouting report, basically, on the first team uh, that he was going to play at home, uh, is, I think. So um, you know, and, and that was when we were able to talk through a little bit more just about basketball. You know, I'm not an expert. In, in coaching basketball, that's what I'm trying to hire. Uh, so, you know, while I liked personality and what I thought was fit and the academic background, the way that he uh, articulates and presents his vision, you know, you do have to feel really good about the basketball part. So, um, very well prepared. Um, I. I I knew he, or at least I was getting the impression that he would fit in, that we would be a good partner. He asked good questions, you know, of me as, as well. Um, and I, I just got a, a really good sense that, okay, if we're going to move forward, he does appreciate and was not afraid when I said, like, I do want to win, you know, and I'm very, I would think most people would feel that way in athletics, but not everybody articulates that that is a part of, you know, what I want. But here's how we're going to do that together. And I felt as we were talking through things that we would uh, be in this to, together and uh, have an appreciation for where I would come from, what we need to do for the university, and then how are we going to win games? Um, you know, so uh, I left there feeling, you know, very. I had already felt strongly uh, that he would fit in well, but certainly through that part, you know, that last part of the process felt really good about it too. And what I will say is that each time that he met with the small group or the bigger group that I talked about uh, once he was on campus, you know, obviously I'm touching base with them, you know, as well, and, and the meeting with the president and, and vice president, and um, it was going well. So uh, got a lot of really good feedback throughout that process too. Danny, are you involved at this point, or are you kind of? behind the scenes? Certainly behind the scenes. Uh, Donna and I are still talking pretty regularly in between she's running around, uh, but I was not on campus. At that point, I like to really back away and I'm, I'm there for support. Of course, I mentioned we've already negotiated with the candidates. We've talked to them about what compensation and what assistant coach pool and, and all of that's going to look like. So I've teed it up for Donna and for her team and we've talked through what are those days going to look like and when are we going to make a decision? So I think Donna knows. I kept asking, all right, what are you going to need to make a decision? Do you need me to make any more reference calls? Do you need me to do anything else uh, while you're sitting there making a decision? So. It was all teed up by the time the three candidates came to campus. I was patiently waiting uh, to hear how it was going, and uh, Donna was keeping me, uh, keeping me in the loop. Donna, how did that final decision get made? I mean, you had a number of people involved in the process. Did you need to get check off from all of them? Were there more just gathering opinions? And then was it the president that made the final decision? Was it a mutual between the two of you? Mm -hmm. Discuss that thought process. Yeah, um, it was very fortunate that the, the group of seven or, or so um, offered their feedback right away, you know, so that we, we knew where, where did they stand, what did they think. Uh, to all of their credit, they said, you know, 
they are not the experts in basketball either. They would appreciate wherever I want it to go uh, with the search, but they, they gave their feedback, strengths, and weakness from their perspective. So again, the student development you know, person has a different perspective maybe than the, uh, the member of the Jesuit community has a different perspective than a professor might have or the advancement person. Um, but we're more than you know, happy to share their, uh, their opinions. And then I sat down with the, the president, the vice president, and senior vice president um, to get kind of the, okay, where do we all stand? To their credit as well, the first question was, where do I stand? You know, because they appreciate the fact that, you know, this is going to be a hire in your department and uh, you're going to have to be able to work with this person. Um, and I, I, I will tell you, we all felt very strongly, uh, you know, about where we wanted to go and, and we were on the same page and, you know, so that was easy. We did, we did have to wait to meet until the next morning, which meant, uh, you know, that Tavares was staying around, uh, but that we said we would call, um, whether it was Daniel or, or someone else that was calling him in the morning. So uh, it, I'm sure that was a, a difficult evening as you, you wait for it, but, um, you know, we were all involved in the decision making, but fortunately, you know, we ended up all in the... So all, all three candidates stayed? Yeah, so different ones had different... Uh, that was the plan, right. but because of different schedules, um, right. it would, they were all told that this is when the, the decision would be made in the, in the morning because we did want to finalize. And, and sleep on it, you know, a little bit. Make sure of where you stand. And uh, it was a pretty quick meeting in the morning. So there, was, there wasn't much debate at that point, pretty much. There was Tavares that. had separated himself from the rest of the pool. Yeah, he did a great job. So then I called him and he was, uh, you know, I said, said are, you, are you in your hotel? So I can, uh, you know, come on, we want to offer you the job. And he was, he was getting breakfast already. So <laughs> I, I had to track him down. And, uh, but it was good. It was, I think I can say from our end, we were very happy that, uh, you know, he was going to be our next head coach. Sir. Sure. And, and Tavares, what do you think you did in that last interview that really cemented your candidacy as the best coach for Loyola. Yeah, I think, um, again, after showcasing who I was and sort of, you know, making sure that everyone who was involved understood exactly who I am and why I wanted this job, um, you know, I don't know how the other candidates pushed themselves or portrayed themselves, but I know that I felt really, really good just about the fit again. And so why I went after this job, why they would want to hire me, I just thought it was a perfect match. And, um, you know, that night I slept pretty good until about 5 a.m. <laughs> uh, but I felt like I put my best foot forward and, uh, you know, really made sure that they knew that I wanted the job. And, you know, that, in my opinion, I thought was key. Sure. So if to kind of end this journey, if, if each of you can provide a little bit of advice and for your peers, for uh, coaches that are aspiring to become head coaches, um, what can they do to stand out from their competitors in that process? For ADs, you know, what are some of the things that you learned in this process? And also for ADs and coaches, what are some of the things that they can do to, to make things run smoother, but also to help things end up in an outcome that's positive for them? Yeah. And so for me, I would say first, most importantly, is know yourself. Um, really know who you are and where you can be successful. I've never been one to just go after a job just to get a job. Uh, go after the job you want, that's very important. And then obviously know your job, know the job that you're going after and prepare to get it. Uh, don't just think you're gonna show up and, and, and click your heels and, and it's gonna happen. Like you have to really you know, prepare for the, for the opportunity, prepare for the interview. And then just be yourself, um, be authentic and uh, good things will happen if you can uh, portray yourself as, as being authentic. What's interesting, and uh, it's not ironic, it probably says something uh, about why we ended up where we did, is because from my perspective, I would have started by saying that in the athletic director's chair, make sure you know who you are and you know what is Im important to you. And, and not just that you're going to go out there and say, yep, I want somebody that is from, you know, whether it's a power five, mid-major, whatever you think is important to you. Um, you, you have to be really clear about who you are as a program, as an institution, so that you can then find the right person that fits that, as opposed to just thinking, I already know what kind of um, where someone should come from, and they're going to fit here. It kind of has to work the, you know, the other way, I think. And and for me, uh, what I took from this too is being open to other people's 
perspective. You know, I, especially this being my first time, you know, through as a um, as the athletic director that's going to have to make a hire like this. Um, I, I did start out thinking, okay, I can do this, you know, by myself, and I know enough uh, about the landscape and and people and perspectives, but the truth of the matter is I needed a little bit of help uh, to help me weed through that, to question me. There were times when I, you know, pushed Daniel and, you know, or he might have said to me, you might want to talk to this person and I would question that. And yeah. if you do it by yourself, you don't have that. You know, you can convince yourself of, of things that maybe are not in your best interest. So I know for me, that was the value, you know, that, that I took from that and, and learned from it um, and certainly would help me moving forward. Yeah, I, I would just say, as Donna articulated here, that when the job opens, there's so much thrown at these athletic directors, and you think you may have a plan, and then you're getting calls from all these boosters and alums, and your president, everybody on campus wants to wants to know what's going on in the search. So have a chance and be patient. You know, Donna did a very good job of, all right, we're going to sit down, we're going to organize this, we're going to find out who are the constituents on campus that need to be a part of this process. I'm going to get a search firm involved. We're going to put a plan together. We're going to have a timeline. Here's the date. And we're going to execute the plan and stick to the plan. No matter what gets thrown at us, and there's all kinds of moving parts behind the scenes, and there may be coaches that you think you're going to get, and they end up taking another job, and there's all stuff that it kind of gets crazy behind the scenes, but have a plan, stick to the plan. And then for coaches, you know, be patient as well. Be patient just because the job just opened doesn't mean we're going to be interviewing the next day. I think coaches watching this can see it takes time to develop. So I started getting calls right away when Donna made the decision. Donna and I hadn't even had a chance to talk. And I'm telling coaches, be patient, be patient. Just because you think you're the right fit, you may not be the right fit. So. It needs to take time to develop. Donna needs to get her plan together. The AD needs to get organized, and we'll call you. You know, it, Tavares mentioned it before. Some coaches think if they make the most phone calls or have the most people call on their behalf, that they're going to get the job. That's not the case. So be thoughtful, be strategic, be patient, wait for those opportunities, because you will find the right opportunity. I think, as we've all heard, this was the perfect fit. These two fit very well together. I mean, Northwestern, Georgetown, Georgia Tech, you know, high academic places, you know, Baltimore, the recruiting footprint, working with Donna. Uh, I think it's going to be a really good success story. Good. Well, on that note, thank you for uh, joining us and giving us a little bit of insight into this coaching search process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.